great place. Hi everyone, thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Sonia Siddiqui and joining us today is Diana from RBC. Hi Diana. Hi, how are you? I am great and it's nice to have you online. We had some <laughs> technical issues there, but we are good to go. All thank good. you for waiting everyone. We really appreciate it. Um, so Diana is going to be talking about um, exploring careers in the insurance sector at RBC. Um, I know a lot of you have uh, the same background and we're very interested in this webinar. So um, I hope you can gain a lot and Diana has tons of insightful things to tell us. Um, just so you know that you are all in listen only mode, so we won't be able to hear you, but we will take your questions after Diana's presentation. So for that, please type your questions into the questions tab. Keep them nice and short so we can go over as many as possible. And uh, for best results, please use a laptop or a desktop computer. If you are using um, your uh, mobile devices, such as tablets or cell phones, uh, I recommend downloading the Zoom app. And if you're using a computer, uh, use a Google Chrome as your browser. And everyone will get a recording of this webinar, uh, um, I think tomorrow. But uh, the link that you use today to log in with, the Zoom link, you can use the same link to watch the recording once it's ready. It usually takes a few hours after the webinar. And your feedback is always, always appreciated. So please do fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. And just to tell you a little bit about Access, we've been around for over 30 years helping job seekers such as yourselves. Um, just in the past year alone, we were able to serve over 34,000 job seekers. We work with over 2,200 employers. That includes our community partners, uh, our sponsors such as RBC. They host two webinars a month with us and several um, events and uh, guest speaking events speed mentoring events, um, and more. So, um, and if you wanna know what's going on at Access, I'll tell you more about it towards the end of the presentation. And uh, we've got 30 tailored programs, which include all of our sector specific programs and uh, special programs catered towards youth, for women, women in technology, and we've got seven locations in the GTA, our newest location in Newmarket, and our Markham location actually houses a newcomer RBC center as well. So that location is in partnership with RBC as well. And right now, everything is being served out of our online location. So all of our programs that would normally be offered in person are now being hosted online. And all of our services are also online, which is great because you don't have to come into the office and we're just a phone call or um, uh, online virtual meeting away. So I'm going to hand it over to Diana. Diana, take it away. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, so today we're going to be talking about uh, RBC insurance. A lot of people are aware that uh, RBC, the bank, exists, um, but a lot of people don't realize that we actually have an insurance division. So we're going to be talking uh, a bit about the types of roles that are available in insurance, um, where you might like to go, um, identifying transferable skills, uh, because really insurance is a business just like anything else. And um, the availability of, of roles and uh, areas to grow certainly available within the insurance industry. Um, if we can go to the next screen there. So RBC insurance at a glance, um, we have many different lines of insurance. We have travel insurance. In fact, we're the number one carrier for travel insurance in Canada. Um, we also sell life insurance, health insurance, property, um, auto insurance, reinsurance, which is actually insurance for insurance companies. Um, not very many carriers are actually licensed in Canada to write insurance for insurance companies. So the fact that we are um, licensed to do this is, is actually really good. It speaks to the, um, the security of our insurance company and the company as a whole. We also write insurance for businesses and products and services, and we also have creditor insurance as well. Uh, we are the uh, largest insurance carrier that is owned by a bank uh, in Canada. We have almost 2,600 employees working for us as well, and that's, that's globally. 
Um, and we are actually the first insurance company that's owned by a bank that has retail branches as well. We have offices scattered right across Canada um, with the head office of insurance being in, in Mississauga, Ontario. Okay, next screen. So as we've indicated there, we have uh, all different types. We've got group and health, which is a huge area, a disability insurance. Um, and we do offer, as I said, uh, home and auto products as well, uh, business products. And um, we also offer third party uh, distributor products as well. So we will sell wholesale our life products to brokers. Otherwise, we are a direct writer. So we are constantly hiring for um, agents in that area to sell insurance directly on behalf of RBC. Next screen. So the insurance industry here in Canada will fall uh, under two different uh, lines. So you've had your property and casualty line. So this is the part where we sell insurance to cover homes, um, cars, travel and business. And then there's the life and health care division. So there's disability, uh, critical illness. So there are two different types of licenses that are required in order to sell for, for this. Um, so for property and casualty, you'll need your OTL or what they call other than life. For life, you would need your life license or the LLQP. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about what's involved in obtaining these licenses and where you would have to go. But this is just a small portion of insurance, as I said, this is just the sales portion. There's so many different divisions in there. We also have claims, we have underwriting. If I can ask you to go to the next screen. And this is what we're talking about here. So these are roles that are, are specific to insurance. Um, sales, if, if, if this is something that you might enjoy, if you like meeting with people, talking to clients, that face-to-face -face interaction, um, sales is something that you might be interested in. Um, our actuaries, um, you're very analytical. If you come from a background where you're good with computers or you love math, actuary might be an area that you might be interested in getting into. Um, an appraiser will assist a person in restoring an item that may have been lost or damaged. Um, a broker, again, it's a different type of salesperson. Claims investigator. Uh, claims investigator and loss adjuster, these are very similar types of roles. What happens in this particular role is the insured now needs to make a claim, so they will call you to set up the notice of loss. You'll take the details from them. You'll set everything up in the computer and then you'll review the policy to see what coverages are available to them. And you'll advise them what type of coverages exist and then you'll set them up for repairs or you'll set them up at a treatment center depending on the nature of the claim. If their luggage has been stolen, assist them in replacing that. Uh, so a claims adjuster is, a, is sort of like a, a caseworker, a therapist. You're there for them in that time of need. A uh, loss control specialist is, is similar to a, a risk manager. You're identifying potential areas where risk can occur. Um, so you're good at troubling trouble, spotting trouble before it happens. Uh, marketing, um, again, you're good with promoting. And an underwriter actually will review the application and decide whether or not this would be a good risk for uh, the insurance company to take on. So again, you're good with relationship building, you understand numbers, and you're a good decision maker. So those are the typical types of roles in insurance. Now we're going to talk about some types of roles that people don't normally associate in the insurance industry. So I recruit for 75 different positions uh, within RBC Insurance and less than 5% are sales. So yes, you have your typical roles, but you also have roles that a business needs to operate and function. Uh, for instance, I hire for business development. We have product development, project managers. I have a team of doctors and nurses that I recruit for. So anybody with a medical training, medical background, definitely um, would be some, an area that you might want to consider. Um, we have an SIU team, a special investigations unit team, and that's comprised of senior adjusters and retired police officers. We have a communications area, marketing. There's so many different areas that are available. Whatever your background is, whatever you did before coming to Canada, I'm positive that there are transferable skills that you can use and make a move over into the uh, insurance industry. Um, I think that was it, or do we have one more screen there? Yeah, okay, so that, 
that was it there. So um, that's um, insurance as a whole. What we wanted to do was to leave time for you to ask questions about RBC insurance or the insurance industry. Um, I also believe we had some um, um, attachments about um, telephone um, interview tips, things like that. Is that right, Sonia? Yeah, sorry, we won't be able to send the attachments okay. to everyone. That's but, okay. Uh, yeah, we can, you can talk about it, you can go over it. Yeah, can, um, okay, so what I'll do is, do you have, um, oh, I guess we don't have it there, right? Can we, we can't bring it up on the screen? Is it possible, the I attachment? Can do that. I can do that. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, so um, while Sonia's bringing that up, um, what I would encourage you to do, if insurance is something that is a, a very of an interest to you, have a look at the website called the Insurance Institute of Canada. So Insurance Institute of Canada. All the insurance companies in Canada are members of this program. So this is the um, area where we go to obtain our certifications, um, education, licensing, things like that. Um, have a look at that website, go to the career section there. There's actually a quiz that you can take there. And depending on how you answer that quiz, it'll identify areas that may be of interest to you or you might do well in. All the courses available for certification um, are through this website um, as well. And it'll give you a good idea as to um, what uh, you need in order to make a move uh, in the insurance industry. Okay, I see you had it up there. Awesome, thanks. So we're gonna talk a little bit about resume uh, writing and then we're going to go to um, uh, interview tips. So as far as resume writing is concerned, um, ideally it shouldn't be more than two pages. Uh, I know that um, many of you may have been working for a long time the way I have and you know, you've had numerous, numerous roles in the past, which is great, indicate that. But ideally if we can keep it to two pages or a little over two pages, that's fantastic. And keep it at a very simple level, something that um, somebody in high school could understand. And the reason we want to keep it at a simple level is a recruiter spends an average of 10 to 20 seconds per resume, and then they move on to the next one. So you wanna keep it in a format that's easy to read, um, that they can understand. Uh, don't get too technical. Save the te technical piece for when you're actually speaking with the business or the hiring manager. Keep it straightforward and just let the recruiter know what you have been doing, um, any successes that you've had, any special projects that you've uh, worked on. Cater your resume to the role that you're applying to. Use a similar terminology that the business has used. If they're looking for particular programs or applications, and you have that, make sure you put that in your resume. Because if it's not a recruiter looking at the resume, it's a computer looking at them. A lot of companies have engaged um, computers to do the first scanning. So a computer will be looking for those keywords. And if you don't have those keywords in there, you're liable to be missed. So that's why it's always important to cater your resume to the role and to the company that you're applying to. Avoiding fancy fonts, uh, special effects, Again, just keep it straightforward. Um, there's nothing more frustrating than opening up a resume and it looks like a wedding invitation and you can't read it. So just keep it straightforward. Roman times, as I said, Arial, you know, uh, Calabria, whatever it is, just keep it very straightforward and easy to read. Also preparing it in Word format uh, because most computers can view Word. Try to stay away from using tables or a template because sometimes when they open it up, everything becomes askew. Um, so if it's in a simple word format, virtually all computers can open that up. They won't have any issues. Um, as far as your job order, uh, I recommend that you use a reverse chronological order. So your most recent job is at the top and that's where most of your points will be because that's where most of your transferable skills will be, probably in your last one to three roles. So concentrate on those roles at the top. If you have roles from 10, 15 years ago, that's fine, mention them. You can put one or two points down if you'd like, but make sure that wherever there are any transferable skills in any of your roles that you've identified that. So let's say they're looking for somebody who is uh, interested in a customer service oriented role. So you have customer service experience in three out of the five roles that you've held in the past. Make sure you put that down in those three positions, because as a recruiter, I'll be looking at that and I'll see, okay, 
she has customer service experience, which is great. But I also see that you have that in three out of the five roles, and that's a total of 10 years worth of work. So now I see, oh, you have 10 years worth of customer service experience. This is what I'm looking for. So that's why it's important to take the time to cater your resume to that role that you're applying to. Don't get hung up on objectives at the beginning, at the top. Just a, a one or two sentences is fine. Ideally, the, in, the business wants to know what you can do for them, that they're really interested in what you can bring to the table. Skip information that's too personal. I've had um, people indicate on their resumes who their father is, you know, uh, where they were born, how many children they have. We don't need that information. Just keep it very uh, catered to the position. Um, I just need to know that, you know, your name, address, email address, um, phone number. Um, you know, if, if you're new to the country and you have permanent residency, that's always great to indicate. Can work in Canada, um, has PR status, um, or if you're here on a work permit, that's fine too. We have a, an immigration advisor on staff to assist us with that. So hiring somebody on a work permit isn't an issue. So you can just indicate work permit and then the year that it expires. And that's fine. We're good to go. Not a problem at all. Um, fuzzy keywords and phrases uh, such as that should be avoided. Just be concise and, and tell the recruiter what you actually did. And finally, and this here is probably the most common sense thing that you can do and probably the number one thing people don't do. Have somebody else read it just to make sure it makes sense and there aren't any spelling mistakes because spell check isn't going to pick everything up because if you type a word in that exists, spell check will just recognize it as a valid word, but it might not make sense in your sentence. Um, how many times have you worked on an assignment or an essay? You've been working on this for hours, trying to get it to look perfectly. The human brain starts filling words in that aren't there when you stare at something for hours on end. That's why it's important after you've completed it, have somebody else read it because if there are any words missing or if there are any spelling mistakes, a fresh set of eyes will pick it up. I've had people who have applied and been technically sound, had everything that I needed, but this one gentleman had five different spelling mistakes in the first paragraph at the top. And I thought this isn't good because this to me um, represents how they pay attention to detail. If you're representing RBC Insurance and you're sending out letters or, or you're working on a project, I can't afford you to have, have spelling mistakes like this all over the place because this is the impression that an insured or a lawyer has about us. You need to make sure that it, it's done properly. Um, and so take the time to have somebody just have a quick look at it and, and you'll be good to go. Alrighty. Um, so let's go on to the uh, next one there. The, um, interview tips. Now there's a, a group of them. I'm only going to go over um, four or five, uh, the more common ones, and then we'll, we'll open uh, the floor up to questions. Okay. So this first one here, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. This is what I call the elevator spiel. Um, so first thing a manager is going to do when you sit down with them is say, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself. Who are you? What's your background? And this is where you talk very high level, right? Um, you know, some of the experience that you've had, um, you know, some of the knowledge, why are you interested in this role, um, uh, relative uh, achievements, things like that. No more than one or two minutes. That's all we need. Another important question, the next one there is, why are you interested in this job? Um, we ask that all the time. I, I ask them, why are you interested in the company and why are you interested in the job? Because we want to know that you genuinely are interested in this role, that you've taken the time to find out a little more, more about the role, interest in a little bit more about the company. One thing I can't stand is when I'm interviewing somebody and I ask them, why are you interested in RBC? And they just basically go to our website and just start reading everything off about RBC. You know, anybody can do that. Anybody can do that. Why are you interested in RBC? Well, what what is it that attracts us to you? And, you know, picking out one or two points is great. Oh, you know, the fact that you give back to the community. Yeah, that's in there, but it's in your own words. You don't have to sit here and say absolutely everything about the company, that it's the largest organization. We have this many people working for us. We're about, we're, we're in these many countries, this and that. I want to know what appeals to you. 
okay? That tells me a lot about you. That's who I want to get to know is you, the person. Um, so yeah, why are you interested in this job? If you actually have done some research on it, to me, it shows that you genuinely are interested. The integrity is there. And I know that if you do get this job, I'm not going to lose you after two months if something else, you know, comes by your desk. All right. Um, so let's go on to the uh, next question there. Scroll down, please. Actually, uh, and there, there are tips in that too. So um, that'll be on the... Um, uh, on the uh, attachment. So areas that you can improve on. This is, this is huge. Um, what ideally what we want to do is um, stay away from behavioral traits. What you want to do is concentrate on, on a skill. Um, actually, if I can ask you just to kind of make it a little smaller so we have a, a few more of the points there um, so they can see. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, so they can see it. Yeah, that's great. Um, so Ideally, what we want to do is um, pick a skill set that you can work on. So if somebody says, give me an area of an opportunity, what is it that you need to improve on? What, what has a manager said to you in the past that, you know, we need to work on this? Stay, stick to something that you can learn as opposed to a behavioral trait because behavior is much harder to change. You know, so something like I procrastinate or I, you know, I work better when I'm um, under pressure and um, it's, it's last minute and I, I, I need that push. No, stick to something like maybe, um, you know, I'm not that strong in Excel, so I've taken a, an Excel course. Or, um, you know, my, my role requires me to generate reports this particular program that we were working with, I know offers a lot more, so I wanted to learn more. So this is what we want to see, something that you can overcome and, and, and show that you actually try to learn from the feedback that you receive and make yourself better for it. Um, so as I said, key factor, stay away from um, behavioral or, or personality traits. Those are much harder to change. Um, if I can ask you to scroll down a little more, I just want to have a look at, uh, uh, um, okay, so areas of strength and weaknesses, again, that's similar to um, what we just discussed there. Um, strengths, though, use this as an opportunity to sell yourself. I know traditionally we, it, we feel very awkward talking about ourselves. It's as though we're bragging, but really, during an interview, you are not bragging. This is the time to sell yourself. Nobody will think that. You talk about what you've done well, um, you know, positive feedback that you've received. Why did your previous uh, company love working with you? Why did they not want to let you go? Um, this is what I want to hear. Sell yourself. It may feel a little awkward, but definitely do it, okay? Because nobody else is going to do it, and that's the time that you need to do that. Uh, what's important to you in a job? This is another question that, um, you know, they may ask because they want to know whether or not um, what this role entails will actually be something of interest to you. So let's say, you know, they may say, what do you like in a job? What don't you like in a job? So, oh, I, I hate doing reports or, um, you know, I'm not very good in Excel. So, yes, it's staying away from anything analytical like that isn't for me. You know, and if the job itself requires you know, weekly, monthly, yearly reports, continuous reports, then we know that, hey, you know what, this isn't something that you're going to be happy in. Because in the end, yes, I know you're trying to find a job, but the recruiter is also trying to find the best job suited for you. So if you're honest when you're speaking with them, and if the recruiter may think, okay, you know what, you're not necessarily the best fit person for this role, but I have another role on the go that I think you'd be fantastic for. Use the recruiter to help you find something because in the end, we want to find the best fit for you because the last thing I want is to have you call me, you know, two months from now and say, Di, you know what? This role isn't what I thought it was going to be and uh, I, I, I need something else. Then you leave and I'm back to square one again. Um, so it, it, it's just been a waste of your time. I mean, I had a situation where... Um, uh, a candidate had um, applied for an entry level position and um, it was just like a document scanner and, and she was doing fantastically uh, well, but I, I could tell that she also had great customer service skills, you know, loved working with people and loved helping people on her resume. I saw that um, she had actually worked in um, 
in an office. Um, uh, it was a, a clinic, a vet clinic. So people were bringing their pets in um, because they were sick. So she was a receptionist there. She had a little bit of medical training, you know, because she could understand the terminology when she was reading the reports and that. And, and I brought this to her attention and I said, so you, you really enjoy working with people and helping people? She said, yes, absolutely. And I saw her resume. I said, well, I see here you have this this um, training that you worked in an office, a medical office, um, and that you handled customers who would come in at, you know, difficult times. Um, you know, they'd be upset because their pets were ill. And part of that role is to be able to calm people down. And I said to her, have you ever thought about applying to a, a disability analyst role? And she said, no, you know, I don't have any claims training. And I said, you know what, you'd be trained on the product, but you have the right mindset. You have a bit of uh, medical training, which is great. It's not necessary, but it's an added bonus. So I asked her to apply for my disability as well. Um, and she did, and she got the disability role. So here it was, you know, we were chatting. I got a feel for who she was, where she was coming from. And I actually suggested that she apply to a role that was three levels higher than the one that she originally applied to, which also means much more money. So that's why it's in your best interest to let the recruiter know the real you be honest in your responses you know talk about what you like what you don't like um, because if if this role isn't going to work chances are there's something else that's out there that they they may be aware of okay um, if we can talk a little bit about give an example of how you reacted when things didn't go your way or your work was criticized again the manager just wants to know that they can speak with you and your back isn't going to go up. You're not going to take offense to it. You'll learn from the feedback and you'll learn from the experience and grow. That is key. When we're interviewing people, it's nice if they have, you know, nine out of 10 of the skill sets that we're looking for. But you know what? You don't have to. Um, I've hired people who have had six or seven out of 10 of what I'm looking for, but they have the right attitude. And I know I can work with them, I know I can develop them. We can teach you the technical piece. What we can't teach you is what comes from within. Either you have it or you don't. And just because you're great in sales doesn't mean you'd be great in an analytical role or a customer, like a claims position. And there's nothing wrong with that. We need all different kinds of people for all different types of roles. A company needs all different kinds of people in all different areas for it to succeed. So no, that the skills that you bring to the table are definitely transferable. And hey, if we don't find one something in one area, we'll just look in another. It's important to keep your options open. Alrighty, so if we can scroll down, um, I'm not sure how much more um, there is on that. Um, let me just see. Oh, this is a good question. How did you prepare for this interview? Uh, this is great because it actually shows that you're genuinely interested in the role you're taking the time to learn more about the company taking time to learn more about that product um, or that department um, look the people up the people that are you're going to be inter who are going to be interviewing you look them up in uh, linkedin see what their background is maybe you have some type of similar background maybe you went to the same school or took the same program something that you can relate to to develop that connection uh, during the interview um, what are your short-term and long-term goals? This is a great question um, that we ask all the time. The reason we ask that is that we want to make sure that the position that you're applying to um, will assist you in, you know, your future goals, but it isn't a stepping stone where I'm only here for two months just to get what I need and then I'm going to move on, right? Um, so you want to make sure that that career development plan is laid out and that the person sees that, yes, okay, this will help you. What you're gonna learn from this role will help you further on down the road, um, but it's not a stepping stone of I'm only gonna be here for two months and then I'm gone. Ideally, um, empl employers like to see you in the role for anywhere from you know, 18 months to two years before you decide to make a move into another area. And to be honest with you, obtaining two years of experience under your belt in a certain area will only assist you further on down the road. Um, you never know where you're going to end up. Like, look at me. Um, I'm presently now working in HR. I never thought I'd be working in HR. I, I come from the business side of things. I started off as an adjuster. Um, and then I, I, I made a move into quality assurance. From there, I was a trainer. After that, I was a business analyst. 
And then I made the move over into HR. Um, I was a claims adjuster for 10 years. And I have to tell you what I learned in that role has helped me immensely in what I'm doing right now. Um, the skill sets are absolutely transferable. Instead of interviewing clients and people who've been in accidents, I'm interviewing people and I'm, I'm probing, I'm, I'm you know, getting in to, into the story, finding out a little more about them. So you never know where you're going to end up. Keep your options open, try different areas because anything you learn will absolutely help you further on down the road and in your next role. You're never ever wasting your time in whatever role you take. Um, my business analyst role, you know, taught me discipline, taught me how to, you know, um, that analytical aspect of it. Quality assurance, um, checking for detail, um, my coaching and um, uh, mentoring as well. When I was a trainer, again, teaching me how to, you know, speak with people, um, develop those relationships, explain things in a manner that others understand. Each one of these roles has helped me in uh, a role that I might have taken further on down the road. Down the road. All right, so let's uh, continue on then. Uh, past the short-term and long-term goals. Um, is that it? Uh, I think so. All righty, excellent. So these are just some sample questions that you may get um, during an interview. The one thing I would recommend though is that when you do go into an interview, ideally come, come in with about four or five great examples of what you've done well um, or an area that you've approved upon or the, an area where there was a conflict and you had to overcome this, maybe develop a relationship with somebody that it just started off on a bad foot, or maybe you're taking over something from a project from somebody else and the client or the customer didn't have a good relationship with them. So now you're entering the scene and right from the get-go, they don't like you. So you have to overcome that. Just come in with a couple of examples of how you've overcome things, things that you've done incredibly well, and you'll be able to use those examples in your responses. Um, as a recruiter, when we're asking you questions, if you could substantiate your responses with an example, love it. Absolutely love it. Because to me, it shows that, yeah, you actually are doing what you're saying because you're, you're, you're showing this with an example. So I know you understand what I'm looking for and what I mean. Um, so anytime you can explain yourself by an example, by adding an example, it's only to your benefit. The other thing I would say too is um, practice your responses out loud. In your head, when you're, when you're thinking about the interview and you're thinking, okay, they're gonna ask me you know, A, B, C, and D. Um, in your head, everything sounds great. But when you actually start saying it out loud, you realize, oh, you know what? Maybe I should say this first and this second. Um, so your responses will flow better. Not only that, you'll sound more comfortable in your responses. You'll feel more confident. Um, it'll be a better you presenting yourself. Uh, how many times have you been in school and when you had to write an exam and you left and it was like, oh my gosh, I forgot to say this, I forgot to say that. If you practice your responses out loud, you'll actually have a better way, uh, uh, sorry, a better chance of remembering four out of the five points that you wanna bring to the table. So that's why it's important to practice your responses out loud before you actually go in for an interview. You will feel more confident. You will sound more confident. Uh, as I said, a better you will be presented. And I think that's pretty much it for now. Um, I'm, and uh, Sonia, if you want to continue or if we want to take questions, um, whatever you prefer. We can start taking questions. So everyone, if you can type your <clears throat> questions into the questions tab. Um, yeah, so like I said, please keep your questions nice and short. We will take uh, quick mm -hmm. one-liners because we've got lots of questions here. Okay. Um, all right, so if someone's a civil engineer um, mm -hmm. and they're interested in you know, entering the insurance sector, what's mm -hmm. the first few steps they should take? Okay, um, excellent. So civil engineer, you've got a lot of great experience. You, I see here, you know, do you need insurance experience? No. Um, for a lot of the entry level positions, no previous insurance experience is required. If you start into an intermediate or, or senior position, then yes, we're looking for it. Um, but 
the, uh, the majority of our roles, we're not looking for ins previous insurance experience. Um, it's a nice to have, but absolutely not necessary. Um, I see here that said you were um, rejected because you needed Canadian regulator experience. Um, so when it says entry level role, I, I'd really be curious as to what the role was. It, it, it might have been more of an intermediate um, one. Again, if you're working with the Canadian regulator, that role then sounds like it was more of fiscal related. Um, so then you would need that specific type of experience. But insurance as a whole, uh, just working in the industry, unless you're working with a specific government regulator, then no. Um, so our um, call center positions, we have classes going through every month. Um, we have two types of roles in the call center. We have our sales oriented roles and we have our service oriented roles. Again, with our sales, you do need to be licensed, but you don't have to have the um, insurance experience. We will help you get that license. For the service oriented ones, we're just looking for people who have good customer service skills. You're gonna be trained on the product, um, but you won't have to sell. So then no licensing is, is required, okay? All right, uh, so next question there. Uh, Nigeria, insurance professional qu uh, qualifications in Canada. Oh, okay, so you've got um, uh, ma uh, master's in science and insurance risk management. Okay, and chartered insurance uh, professional from London. Okay, so do I need to write exams uh, at the Insurance Institute? That's a great question. So if you have certifications from other countries, um, a lot of them will translate over to Canada. Um, in order to obtain the certification here, you have to have 10 courses under your belt. So what they might do is they would have a look at the courses that you've taken and they might say, okay, you know what? Seven out of the 10 are good. You may have to just write two or three. Um, each one is different. So you are gonna have to reach out to the Insurance Institute um, to see which ones um, are relevant but definitely um, the majority of them will be, especially if you're coming from a country that um, is British based um, because the Canadian Institute is based on the British system as well. Um, so I'm guessing that if you have the chartered insurance professional from London, I would say that the majority, if not all of it, uh, would be transferable to uh, a Canadian designation. But that's something that you'd have to check out with the Insurance Institute just to make sure. Yeah, okay. Uh, any other questions there? Ooh, not. Um, so, Sonia, if you can just move them up there or just read it to me, that would be great. Yeah, I'll, I will read some. Awesome, thank you. Because <laughs> uh, I thought you took over. <laughs> like, uh, so did I, but yeah, it's not working. So if you could, that would be awesome. Thank you. Okay, so <laughs> how does RBC Insurance pay? Is it is it a good career to have? Okay, excellent. Um, so with RBC, as far as salary is concerned, uh, depending on the nature of the role, um, our, our sales role, we have entry level sales positions, which are salary plus yearly bonus. Um, but once you start getting into intermediate and more senior sales positions, commission starts uh, coming into play as well. So you could do a 50-50 commission, 50-50 salary. Um, in our life roles or for our senior um, people, it's all commission. The rest of our roles are salary. And then there's yearly bonus associated with that as well. So with the sales positions, there, there are variable bonuses, but everything outside of that, it's a salary. Our contract positions are hourly. And, and that's another thing you should also look at too. Um, contract positions, it gets your foot in the door. Um, if you're here for on a, a one-year contract, you can apply to other roles within the company and you'd be treated as an internal applicant which is always great. Um, so yes, look at contract positions. Um, so as far as uh, our bonuses are concerned, I have to say, uh, you know, it's been pretty good. Um, even with the last recession that we had like in 2009, um, I've been receiving full bonus every year. So the bonus depends on how the bank does and how you perform. So it's a combination of both. And let's face it, the bank always does really well <laughs> every year. Um, so uh, as I said, it, it, it's very, um, very competitive um, with, with uh, other companies out there. Um, and it, it's much more than just salary too. It's the benefits that you're looking at as well. Um, so we do also uh, provide staff discounts on all our banking 
products in that. Insurance, you get a staff discount as well. Um, on the bank side, certain fees are, are waived altogether and some are just reduced. So you've, you've got the benefits there. We have an additional um, retirement uh, program that you can ben uh, contribute to. Uh, and the company will match dollars as, as well there. Um, there's so many different um, benefits to joining a company like ours. Um, and it's the culture as well. Um, we really do believe in that employee development and growth. Um, if there's a course that you want to take that will assist you in the role that you're in right now, like let's say, for instance, you're, you're in insurance and you want to take some CIP courses, after you pass the course, we'll reimburse you for that. So we'll help you in obtaining um, those degrees and certifications. Um, not only that, but just the way we work is the manager will sit down with you after a year, year and a half and say, where do you wanna go from here? What is it that you wanna do? It's actually in your manager's mandate to help you get to that next level. Um, they'll arrange job shadows for you in other areas. Let's say you're working in sales and you wanna get into marketing. We'll arrange job shadows for you. We'll put you in touch with people in our marketing department. So when a position does come up in marketing, they'll already know you. You've had the benefit of networking in that area. And that's something that's, that is huge in, in, in the North American um, culture is the networking piece, uh, especially when you're dealing with a, a large corporation such as RBC. Networking, networking, that's the best thing that you can do. Get to know people in the departments and give, give them an opportunity to, uh, to get to know you as well. All righty. Next question there, Sonia. Um, are there specified licenses or certifications needed for certain roles? Yes, great question. If you're going to sell insurance, you must be licensed. Um, we have two different types of license. Um, well, there's three, actually. There's the Rebo, which is, which is what brokers use, but we're, we're not a brokerage. Um, we actually have direct... Um, agents. So there's the OTL, other than life, and then there's the LLQP, which is the license for to sell life insurance. Outside of sales, uh, no licensing is required. When you start getting into intermediate or, or senior in positions in insurance, it's nice to see the insurance certification, the CIP, which is obtained by the Insurance Institute of Canada through there. But that's just courses about the insurance industry as a whole. Um, but um, specifically, no licensing is required unless it is a sales position. And then the posting will indicate what license it is that, uh, that you need. Next question. Um answered a lot of them. Okay, that's good. Um, what types of insurance projects is RBC work currently working on? Uh, insurance projects? Okay, great question. Um, digital is huge. Um, um, cyber risk is huge. Um, uh, all these applications that we're putting on phones in that, um, they're very progressive, very progressive. Um, so constantly seeing what the market wants, what people want, and, and then uh, developing a product for that. We actually, what we do on a yearly basis is um, we bring students in from all different uh, types of universities, colleges, all different backgrounds. And we, we bring them in for a couple of months during the summer and we just ask them to brainstorm. Um, kids have this great way of just thinking outside of the box. Um, they're not limited or restricted the way, you know, I, I may have become over the years. It's like, okay, I've been doing this job for years and now I'm thinking this is how we do it and this is the way we've always done it. Um, so what we do is, you know, people will come up with ideas and say, oh, wouldn't it be great if you could do this or you had a product like this? And we present this to the kids and that's their project for the summer. How can we do this? And you would be surprised as to what they come up with. Um, in fact, the majority of the applications that we have on our phones for RBC clients have been developed and created by students. So um, it, it, it's just absolutely fantastic to, to be able to you know, work with somebody who, who can think outside of the box so freely. Um, but there's a lot on the go. Um, our, our project PM team is, is constantly busy, the business analysts constantly working. And it's not just insurance, it's, it's right across the board. Uh, the bank as well, capital markets, you know, wealth management. Um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot happening, especially now with COVID too, you wouldn't think it. But um, COVID has made us realize that 
you know what? Um, the company doesn't have to look the way it did before. People don't have to come in the way they did before. Um, people have the ability to work from home and, it, it, and it's okay. Everything's functioning. Things are running smoothly. So now we're looking at what's the company going to look like a year or two from now once COVID is over? Do we have to go back to the way we were before? No, we don't. So this is something that they're working on now, change management. You know, what are the roles going to look like? What is, what is the structure of the company going to look like? And this is something that we're just starting to work on now. And this is going to be a huge project, you know, over the next couple of years. Next question. Thank you, Diana. Um, <clears throat> good question here. To take the exam for general insurance, do they need a sponsor or an employer? No, no. You just do this on your own. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. And, um, all right, you've answered a lot of these questions. Good, good. <laughs> I'm trying to cover um. as much as I can, because <laughs> I, I know we're limited in time. So, you know, I want to answer as much as I can. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, can you talk more about the roles in the call centers? Sure. Um, this is a huge area. Mm -hmm. And that's a great question. Thank you. Um, call centers are probably the best way to get your foot in the door. Um, in a call center position, um, you get to know the product, you get to know the culture, you get to know the clients, you get to know what works, what doesn't work, what sells, what doesn't sell. Increases your communication skills, uh, your negotiation skills. There's so many different things that you learn by working in a call center. And I have to say the call centers in the office today fantastic. Uh, a lot of people think, you know, 10 years ago, the call centers, nobody wanted to work there. But today I have people who have been working in there for 10, 15 years because they love it. It's a bright environment. It's fun. It's engaging. The teams are great. They're always doing things together. Um, so definitely a different, uh, a different culture from the way it was a number of years ago. Um, but back to, you know, why start off in a call center? As I said, it gets your foot in the door. Um, and then you can start networking with people in other areas. Um, we hire people with, um, you know, master's degrees, um, you know, certifications left, right and center with the knowledge that we will be promoting you and moving you somewhere else within the company. Last year, I hired 250 people and 40% of my hires were internal moves. So we really do believe in that employee development and growth. We know that if we hire you in a call center position, our goal is to have you out of there in two years if you want to move. If you want to stay there, that's fine. That's fantastic. But if you want to move, our goal is to have you move out of there within two to three years and get you on the path as to where you want to go. Um, so it's a great place to start. Um, contract positions, call center positions. And the nice thing about call center positions is that we have classes going through every month. Sometimes there's even two classes going through. Um, so you know that the opportunity is there. Um, with the call centers, when you apply online, what they'll do is they will send an assessment out to you um, if they see that your skill sets are or what it is that they're looking for. An assessment will be sent out to you. If you pass the assessment, the recruiter will then contact you and conduct a telephone interview. Um, and then from there, um, they'll decide who they'd like to proceed with. Uh, but con call centers, probably the easiest way and the best way to get your foot in the door. So let's say you're interested in an actuarial role. But actuarial roles can be difficult uh, to get into because they don't come up as often. If you start off in the call center, um, as I said, you can start job shadowing and networking with the people in the actuarial world. So when a position does come up, they'll already know you. So you can still obtain that goal that you want. You could still get into project management. You could still get into communications, but you're coming in through the back door. So continue applying and looking for those roles that you're interested in, but also strongly consider the call center positions because it gets your foot in the door and then you can make a move into uh, another area further on down the road. Thank you, Diana. Um, are oh, there any part-time oh, yeah. positions? Um, insurance traditionally um, 
I think we only have one part-time position, to be honest with you. The bank does have a lot of part-time positions. Um, so definitely have a look on the bank side if part-time is something that is better suited to, to your lifestyle and your family commitments in that. Um, and, and that's the nice thing about working up with RBC Financial Group as a whole, is you can make a move from the bank side to insurance, or you can make a move from insurance onto the bank side. We're all under one umbrella. We're all treated as um, internal applicants. And, and, and further to that internal applicant piece as well, if you know anybody that works at a company that you're applying to, whether it be RBC or, or anywhere, use them as a referring employee. Obviously, ask them if you, can, if you can use them as a referring employee first, but if they say yes, absolutely use them as a referring employee. That always helps. And why? Because we know good people bring good people in. Um, if you apply to a role at RBC and you know somebody who works here, have that person send an email to the recruiter saying, hey, you know what? Um, I've, I've known this person for X amount of years, uh, great attitude. I think they'd definitely be an asset to the company. I think they'd be a great person for this role. We will definitely have a closer look at you and, and uh, reach out to you if those skill sets are there. Um, use that within any company that you apply to. And networking, again, stressing that piece. If you're out at, at uh, a party or you're at some cultural event, um, you know, get to know the people that are there. Find out where they work. Uh, find out you know, what they do. Because chances are, um, RBC is actually the largest employer in Canada next to the military. We have 80, 86,000 people working here. So chances are, if you're at a party with 50, uh, 40, 50 people, okay, now with COVID now, um, but if you're talking to people, um, chances are somebody there works for the company or knows somebody that works there or has a spouse or a family member that works there. Or just find out what companies that they're working at themselves. Get to know these people and network and use them as referring employees. That helps. It definitely goes a long way um, in, your, in your journey in uh, obtaining a new role. Thank you so much, Diana. That does bring us to the end of our presentation. I'll let you. Wow. Um, <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> I know. And um, I'll let you wrap it up and then I'll just go over a few more. Okay. Slides. All right. So with RBC, um, all of our roles are online. So um, if you are interested, what I would suggest is go to rbc.com. And you can go to the career section and you'll see what's available. It is a little quiet right now um, because of COVID, but things are starting to open up in the province. So positions will start opening up again, but the call center positions are always there. Um, apply directly online and um, best, of, best of luck to you um, in, in whatever you do and wherever you end up. Know that you do have transferable skills. You've got a lot to offer. Um, don't sell yourself short. Um, you know, just try something new. Um, and I, I know I'm positive it'll work. It may take a little time, but persevere. Something will come through. Thank you so much, Diana. Very inspirational and fully insightful. Mm -hmm. um, I hope everyone got all the information they needed. Um, and uh, in any case, RBC comes back twice a month. If you have more questions, you know, they're mm -hmm. here to answer your questions. Um, and you can contact them as well. Um, and we've got, towards the end of the month, we have a few more ladies from RBC coming and presenting, and they will uh, be able to answer all of your questions as well. Um, our next webinar coming up is LinkedIn related, and Khatija Qureshi, who's a LinkedIn guru, she's done this three-part series, and this is her last part um, that she's presenting. And it's just so great that it takes three parts to do it. So. <laughs> Sign up for it and uh, you'll be able to see, get uh, recording links for the first two parts as well. And um, just to let you know that all of our programs and services are being held online. If you do want to speak to an employment consultant to help get started with your job search, um, you can call your closest access location and someone will be able to help you virtually. And we do have a Talk English Cafe, which is virtual as well. Um, if you'd like to practice your English speaking skills, please sign up for that as well. And I was going to tell you about our pre-arrival services. So if you have your PRs and you're on your way to Canada within the next few months, email cec at accessemployment.ca to see if you'd be eligible for the program. And they can start helping you with your job search before you land in Canada. 
And again, there is a survey at the end of the webinar. Please do fill it out. You will get a recording uh, two days from now, or you can access the same Zoom link. Uh, it turns into the recording a few hours after the webinar. And stay in touch with us. We are very active on social media. So follow us on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Thank you so much again, Diana. And we would love to have you back soon. I would love to come back. And, and if I can just add one more thing, sure. um, I have to say, um, for those of you that are part of this access program, this is a phenomenal program. Um, use all the amenities that they have. RBC works very closely with them. And I can honestly say this is probably one of the best vendors that uh, we work with. We've hired many people through your program and they've been absolutely fantastic. Um, so use the, um, the um, programs that they have. Um, speak to the people at Access because they really do have your best interests at heart and they will do everything that they can in order to find employment for you, whether it be with RBC or anywhere. But honestly, this is probably one of the best um, organizations out there for something like this. Thank you so much, Diana. Yes, we do. Uh, we work very closely with RBC and RBC ends up hiring a lot of our uh, alumni, people who've been through our programs. And it's just so great to see, to come, have them come back and do yeah. webinars with us too and guest speaking mm -hmm. events. So it's a great cycle and it's very positive and we're very proud to be working with RBC so closely. So thank you everyone again. I hope everyone has a great day ahead and happy early weekend to whoever is not working tomorrow. All right. Take care everyone and we'll see you soon. Bye.